Every meal also is a, uh, injecting into us a mentality of exclusion. The subtext of every meal is that, well, we just don't care about them, right? <laughs> Uh, we, care, we care about some, we don't care about them. So again, what, what veganism is, it's radical inclusion. It's saying I'm going to include all living beings within the sphere of my kindness and compassion. And again, this is really the foundation of happiness and, 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 and sanity to see the interconnectedness of all life. The, all the world's wisdom traditions, all the great spiritual traditions, religious traditions, the founders of these, the people who really awoke to a higher level of awareness were all basically awakening to an understanding of the interconnectedness of life. They were seen to be very kind and loving people. It wasn't because they, they were putting on a, f- a fake front or something. They, were, they really saw that if I hurt someone else, I'm hurting myself. That we, if I, if, when I, the more I manipulate another for my own benefit, the more I actually harm myself. That we, we deaden our own sensitivity and our own possibility for happiness. That we create a society of joy and freedom as we understand our interconnectedness. And then finally, I mean, I could go on more here, but uh, the other main thing is um, every meal is also essentially injecting into us uh, in our, our consciousness a, um, a repression, really, a repression of uh, what I refer to in the World Peace Diet as Sophia, which is the sacred feminine uh, dimension. And I think this is very important to understand because you know, animal agriculture from the very beginning is not been, it's not been merely about human beings uh, exploiting and abusing animals. It has more specifically been men, you know, human males, dominating and exploiting female animals. You could not have animal agriculture without that, specifically, without impregnating them against their will. And any mother, when she gives birth to a baby, she knows I, I, that's my baby. I want to love and care for that baby. And, and this is true across species. And yet, um, on any animal agriculture operation, large or small, backyard or you know, factory farm, it's never her baby. <clears throat> that's always the owner. It's my baby. I'm going to take that baby. I'm going to impregnate you again. And so, <clears throat> this stealing of the baby, this massive sexual violence against female animals, we're talking about 75 million animals a day we're killing, we're, we're raping that many as well, we're causing huge amounts of sexual violence. Again, it's all covered over, no one talks about it, but this, this suppression of the sacred feminine, see, I think we all have, I think we all know this in our bones. We all, we know that there is an, an aspect of human consciousness which is, which is really the foundation uh, uh, of sanity, of, of happy, healthy uh, families and neighborhoods and communities, which is the, the capacity that we all have, whether we are men or women, to love others, to respect them, to care for them, to protect them, to nurture them. And so mothers, of course, this is very clearly very strong. This is the, the sacred feminine wisdom within all of us. And uh, women, as I say, have it especially, but I think men also have this wisdom of protecting and kindness. When, we, when we're raised in a family where we're forced to eat animal foods, that is basically suppressing Sophia. You have to not care about those animals. You have to see them as mere commodities. You have to stab them. You have to impregnate them against their will. You have to manage them, control them. You have to own them as property for your own use. That is a massive violence against Sophia, the sacred phys- wisdom. <clears throat> and so Sophia would rise up See, so our natural wisdom would never let this happen you know when you have Sophia shut down in an entire society by forcing the entire society to eat meat dairy products and eggs then you have a society where we can see what you can see. I mean, we, where we can be cutting down the rainforest at an acre per second, where we can be overfishing the oceans to the point where they're dying, where we can be uh, you know, allowing corporations to come invading into the lives of our children with ads that are targeting them as, as consumers with pornography and violence and everything else they can use to try to suck them in to buy toxic products, and we just let it happen. Sophia would never let it happen. <laughs> Sophia would rise up and say, stop it. These are my kids. This is my earth. This is my life. Stop it, you know, and, and, we, and create something positive. But when Sophia is suppressed by eating meat, dairy products, and eggs, and people just don't have self-respect, they, they feel, they don't make connections, they just, you know, it also creates this infantile mentality of just trusting the authorities. We become little kids. It was so funny, you know, I got off the plane yesterday. I had to get a taxi to come here. And I had this shirt on that had, uh, had Peace Love Vegan on it. <laughs> and this woman, I went to the taxi stand, and she said, oh, I like your shirt. Are you a vegan? And I said, yeah, I've been a vegan. She said, 
Oh, that's, that's really great. She said, I'm, I'm still at the breast. <laughs> I said, oh, you mean you're a vegetarian? She said, yeah, I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> Oh, it's so cute. I'm still, at, I'm still at the breast. I'm still breastfeeding. But, you know, the idea, <laughs> you know, she was probably 60 years old. But the, <laughs> that's the idea, you know, we're still eating dairy products. It's like we don't want to ever grow up. We just want to, you know, have a cow somehow, you know, nurse, nursing <laughs> at the breast of a cow, nursing at the breast somehow. I just don't want, just, you know, life is too painful for me to wear. I'm just going to sort of be in oblivion if I can somehow escape. And, you know, the whole idea in, in all of this is to awaken out of this kind of oblivion, to awaken out of becoming, um, out of being na- naive, you know, just trusting whatever the authorities tell us is true, uh, trusting the, pro- the cultural program uh, which is destroying uh, the very planet that we're living on, uh, to question these things. And when we do that, I think we begin to see this whole other world opens up. And I think an important part of that is to do some real serious introspection, you know, to, to really look deeply into ourselves and see, you know, what, what am I actually? And to question the, the labels that society has put onto us. And I think when we begin to do that, we begin to see that we've been ra- born into a society where we've been forced from the time we're little kids to disconnect from Sophia, the sacred feminine, and from our natural wisdom and compassion, and from the natural sense of being part of a benevolent uh, universe, uh, from the sense of inclusiveness that we naturally have as children, a sense of caring and kindness at a deep level for life, and, and the sense of the beauty and the celebration of life that we're part of. And we, be, and we find ourselves in a competitive society that's hierarchical, where we have to function and we have to do what we can to get ahead, and we have to take what we can. And so that, that whole mentality is founded on one thing, animal agriculture. The me- fundamental mentality in, in a herding culture is domination and exploitation of other living beings against their will. And, when, and with that, I, <clears throat> I have a whole chapter in the little piece that goes into the history of this, how with the beginning, with the dawning of animal agriculture, we had three or four things that happened. I'll just say it briefly. I'll maybe go into it a little bit more tomorrow. But just briefly... Um, we see eight or 10,000 years ago in what is today Iraq, apparently, in that part of the Mediterranean, Western Asia, people started owning, first it was wild sheep, then, and then wild goats, and then later wild cows, and uh, seeing them as mere property objects. And it's well understood by anthropologists that before animal agriculture, people looked at other animals uh, with an eye of respect. You know, they were mysterious and powerful cohabitants of the earth with us. They had capabilities and powers which they couldn't understand and which we still don't understand today, actually, <laughs> how they can migrate all these distances and do all these amazing things that animals do. But anyway, so, but once men started owning certain animal, you know, these animals uh, as property, it was a revolution of reductionism, of reducing them from being mysterious, powerful cohabitants to being mere ob- property objects. And so that, did, that, that, that created a whole cascade effect. So you had essentially uh, animals were reduced and other, all the other animals were also reduced, right? Because now the other animals, the, the coyotes or bobcats or prairie dogs or whatever they were, are threats to my, to my wealth to my capital. And so they become, we got to get rid of them, they become varmints. So we, we, we reduce them to being mere, mere varmints, something to get rid of. And <clears throat> so we see that these uh, animals become, as I say, become wealth. And we have the arising of these uh, very hierarchical societies where you have a wealthy elite. And you, you can re- I used to teach college courses in the Epic of Gilgamesh and the Iliad, the Odyssey, the ancient uh, Old Testament uh, and ancient Greek uh, tragedies and so forth. And you can see very clearly by that time, this is, this is a long time later, <coughs> Uh, this is, uh, these, these first writings are around 3,000 years old, maybe, or 2,500 years old. Uh, but this all started maybe eight to 10,000 years ago. So gradually, over many thousands of years, this gradual revolution took place and took a long time. By that time, you can see it very clearly. There's this, this class of kings, right? These, these super rich men. And they're dominate, they dominate the religion, the economics, and uh, every, every aspect of society and war. They're military. And so... This, this is basically it. This is the society we are born into now. We don't realize it, but that was how it arose with a wealthy elite. They were wealthy and elite for one reason. They owned the most livestock and they ate the most meat and they ate the most dairy. And they began, they did a few things. They, they, they began to look at women 
<coughs> as they began, as they gradually, as they began to look at their female animals that they were impregnated against their will, and who they saw as mere breeders, and so they began to see women as mere breeders. And so we had this whole arising of a patriarchal society based on men dominating animals, of wealthy elite dominating the whole society, and men seeing women merely as objects to be used for breeding and for sexual pleasure. That's, that is inherent in animal agriculture. That, that is what always happens. And so when you have that mentality arising, and then they invented two more things that had never been on the planet before. They invented uh, gavya. Gavya is the ancient Sanskrit word that means the desire for more cows. It, it translates as the word war. So they invented war. So some guy who with all his cows and sheep and goats would see Somebody else over there, he has a lot of cows and sheep and goats. This is the very first get-rich-quick scheme. <laughs> yeah, I can just go and take those and then double my wealth because animals were wealth. The more animals you had, the wealthier you were. And, of course, he's not going to give up without a fight. So we had the beginning of these horrible mass <sighs> clashes. I, I've studied, I've done research into the first wars, these ancient wars. They were hideously violent, horrible uh, things and um, but anyway, you did not want to lose a war back then because if you lost the war, again, what I what I said earlier, whatever we do to animals, sooner or later we do to other human beings. We do to each other, and so we, we now now that we see animals as mere property to be used, as you know, we enslave the animals, it's a small step from enslaving animals to enslaving other people. So they invented slavery. So now we have these animals. Uh, become the property, the human beings become the property, so the men are treated, you know, they're castrated like they did the male animals, so they'll be uh, easy to control, and the women are just impregnated against their will to create more slaves, because slaves are also wealth. And so we had the arising of these violent, warlike societies in Western Asia spreading through uh, Central Asia, eastern, to the northern, eastern Mediterranean, to, to Europe, coming over to North and South America, to Africa, to Asia, you know, basically spreading. And, and this, this system is still spreading today, right? It's spreading through ConAgra and Monsanto and Cargill and Kentucky Fried Chicken and Burger King and McDonald's and the IMF and the World Bank and the whole, I call it the military, industrial, meat, medical, pharmaceutical, media complex, right? <laughs> this huge complex. And, uh, you know, yeah, it's... You know, we're born into that. We have to realize we're born into that system. And the, 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 the absolutely the most subversive thing we can do to that system of violence, the most positive response to that system is to go vegan. There's no more positive response. I mean, to just say, I'm not going part- to vote for that anymore, right? Because once we stop voting for that, then we're going to be voting for something else. We're voting for foods that come... F- that are sustainable, that come from, you know, gardens. I mean, think of it. There's nothing more, more horrible to go to than to a factory farm slaughterhouse operation. I mean, these, the, the, the level of horrific violence and brutality and perversity that go on in these places are so, hor- you know, every time any undercover investigation is ever done, by any of the people that go in and do undercover investigations, whether it's uh, a hatchery, whether it's a slaughterhouse, whether it's a factory farm, whether it's a backyard farm, little small farm, you know, any, anything, small dairy, um, fish operation, they never once fail to capture scenes of horrific, gratuitous abuse and violence of animals. It brings out the worst in people to own them and kill them. And so, um, so this is the situation we find ourselves essentially in, is that we're raised in a society where this is fundamentally forced onto us from the time we're little kids, and we find ourselves now with the possibility of questioning this and realizing that this ancient system that came down through the ages that has been sp- is still spreading through ConAgra and Cargill, that we can do something else. We can raise our own, we can go to a, one of the most beautiful places anyone can go, which is uh, a garden a place where we're growing food, where, where life is, you know, it, it's a miracle. See, animal agriculture is the opposite of plant agriculture. Animal agriculture, the animals were always, are always resisting, right? They don't want to be killed. They don't want to be confined. The worst thing you can do to an animal is to try to confine her. You know, we have a, we have a garden uh, now in Northern California, and I had a kind of a, a fence around it. We were replacing it now that was nylon. It was strong enough to keep the deer. The deer never came in, right? They just wouldn't come in. And, but... Somehow a deer got in one day, and uh, through a gate, I guess, or something. And so then I went in there, and the deer, like, saw me, and, and, and she just broke, and she just smashed that, that fence and just destroyed it. And, and I, 
I just saw, you know, the, the absolute worst thing you can do to a free-living animal is confine them to say, you know, you're my property. I mean, that is something that is in, so insulting to the soul of a human being to do that. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, only people who are very unfree would ever do that. Free people would never do that, to take, make you my property and confine you, and especially to kill. So that, that, the foundation of that mentality and the violence that that's involved in, and, and the beauty is, the, the thing I love about this, really, is it's like, like what Mr. Fuller said. He said, it's not a good idea to fight against a system that is obsolete and uh, stupid and cruel and all these things. Just create an alternative. Create a positive, <laughs> create something else and do that. And that's why I love the, the movement that we're involved with. The, 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 you know, we can, we can live in another way. We can easily feed everyone, like I say, on a fraction of the land. And it's, for me, being a vegan now for 35 years, um, the food just gets more and more delicious. I mean, it's really amazingly satisfying and delicious. And when people say, but don't you ever, I remember this guy said to me, well, don't, sometimes don't you just kind of miss the taste of a burger? And I said to him, you know, I, I'd like to eat a burger about as much as I, I would like to take a bite out of your arm right now. <laughs> I mean, it's not food. I mean, it's like, it's so, such an absurd thing. I, I guess maybe in the beginning, but I mean, nowadays there's, there's these alternatives that actually even the top food editors of the New York Times and all these people cannot tell the difference between the vegan version of chicken and the actual chicken, right? I mean, they can, you know, the technology is getting to the point where you actually don't even know <laughs> what it is. So, uh, so but, it, but the point is that... <clears throat> We have the possibility to now to choose another way of living. And so we have a tendency, of course, to look over our shoulder and look at the past and think, well, how did they do it in the past and, and all of this. But I think the most important thing for us to do, really, the, the wisest thing, is to look towards the future and look at the kind of future we would like to have for ourselves and for our children and our children's children and wor live our lives in that way. Maybe for some reason in the past, people needed to eat meat and dairy to be healthy, to make it, to su survive or whatever. There's no point in yelling at them and being mad at the, the, our, you know, our forebears that way back there that they did a terrible thing. They, whatever, they did, they did the best they could. That's what they did. But we don't have to do the same now. We can make new choices. We can understand that we can all thrive on plant-based diets, that we can use it uh, we, environmentally and culturally and on every other level it's so much uh, healthier for us to do that and we can bring our own lives into alignment with that and live that ourselves and then we can find ways where we can begin to bring this message to other people because I think this is the great gift we can give is to be able, be able to understand this and then share this idea with others however we can. That's why I'm so grateful uh, to anyone who's uh, in some way bringing this message of kindness, compassion, awareness, health, freedom, sustainability, equality, justice. I mean, it's all connected. We are all interconnected. And we're not in some kind of a strange uh, universe, hell realm, where we're only going to be healthy if we just are really miserable and violent and stab animals and each other. And You know, that, that's not it. We're actually raised in a, in a universe where we can thrive and prosper by blessing others. And I think this is the fundamental teaching that, uh, is, is so much, uh, I think we know this in our bones and it's so repressed in our society. The other thing I just want to emphasize uh, here before I, before closing, maybe take a couple of questions, is, um, is that the, there, whatever we do to animals, sooner or later we do to each other. You know, this as we sow, so shall we reap idea. I think it's very important and very empowering to understand that. Like, for example, if we look at the list of problems that we're having that I mentioned at the beginning, every single one of those problems that we're having we are literally inflicting on animals. And then we're having it as a problem. You know, and you look at the, the various, you know, the various diseases that we have, for example, say obesity. You know, we see this, the graphs of obesity, you've probably seen the obesity graphs, it's like, whoa, you know. And yet, if you look at what we've done, what we do to animals and, and the weight of animals over the same period, it's like the same exact graph. <laughs> and we have scientists just who do nothing else than to figure out how you can maximize weight gain in animals because they're sold by the pound. The, the, if you can make them fatter, faster, it's, you make more money, you know. So chickens now, they've gotten it down Amazing, to, to like 37 or 38 days. A chicken comes out of an egg, and within 37, 38 days, they're a big, fat chicken. <laughs> I mean, it's not, that's like a miracle. And so uh, it takes a lot of, you know, a lot of horrible, um, you know, 
manipulation of their bodies and their, and, and their feed and lighting and everything else, but they can achieve that. And, so, and the same thing with pigs and cows. All these animals are, are obese. They're forced into obesity, and we find, gosh, we have this obesity epidemic. And the same thing with most of the other, you know, cancer, osteoporosis, all these things. They're forced on animals, and we get these problems. And, yet then, we, and then we go experimenting on these poor animal, other animals to try to solve the problems we're causing by torturing animals, right? I mean, that's, that's, and we don't make those connections. We don't even see that as a thing. And then uh, you see another problem uh, that, that one of the major problems is social, uh, you know, basically the breakdown of, of family structures and, and s- social structures. And again, animal agriculture is this massive destruction of family and social structures of animals, right? All these animals, when they come in, and when they're looked at, they're all just given a number, and their mothers are always separate from the babies. And there's just basic, and the mo- babies are killed. The mothers are impregnated again. The babies are killed. This is animal agriculture. This is what is done on any operation, large or small, whatever it is. That's what it is. And so it's about destroying families. And how can we expect to have healthy families when our entire way of eating, we're, not, we're, we're destroying animals, and then we're eating it and feeding that to our children. So again, and then, and then you look at the... Um, uh, psychological illness. Uh, you know, pharmaceutical industries <coughs> basically are making huge amounts of money on this. You know, these poor animals that we're eating are driven into insanity. We don't really, they're hyper confined in ways. P- poor pigs are like literally banging their heads against the bars, driven crazy. These are animals that are really intelligent, that, that like stimulation. They're stuck, they can't m- hardly move. Uh, chickens are driven into insanity. All these animals. And so we find, though, that the, the pharmaceutical industry is making huge profits on three areas, right? The ma- three main areas the pharmaceutical industry makes all of its wealth, and, it, and you've noticed how wealthy it is. They can pretty much buy it, the government and the media and everything else. Where do they get their wealth? They get their wealth from people, from selling drugs, right? Who are they selling the drugs to? Well, there's, first of all, the first one, the first huge market for drugs, pharmaceuticals, is animal agriculture, there's over 10,000 different hormones and drugs and antibiotics and chemicals and things that are purchased by, sold to animal agriculture industries, and they're just injected into these animals. It's, uh, it's um, talk about, you know, the whole thing of having freedom to not be vaccinated. These animals don't have the freedom to not be vaccinated. They don't have a choice. It's like, you're going to get this vaccination. You're going to get this. You're going to get this. They're drugged and drugged and drugged and drugged and drugged with all kinds of things. So the pharmaceutical industry makes huge profits on them. Then these poor animals are killed or their milk is drunken or whatever and their, or their eggs are taken. So then people eat that stuff, right? They eat the flesh of these poor drug-tortured animals and the dairy products and eggs that come from that. And then they get the diseases that come from eating these foods, right? And so we know that, again, this is the second market for the pharmaceutical industry. They come in and they make huge profits on people that have the diseases uh, that come from eating these foods like you know, breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer, uh, medications needed for diabetes, for weight gain, weight control, for uh, liver disease, kidney disease, autoimmune disease of various kinds from casein, all these, there's the whole, you know, diabetes, all these things, huge profits for the pharmaceutical industry come from that. Then there's one more, and this is the biggest of the three, People spend, again, (laughs) millions of dollars on pharmaceuticals for mental disease, right? That's the biggest. That's actually the biggest. They get that for depression. What are they eating? Animals that are very depressed. Anxiety. What are they eating? Animals that are very anxious. Insomnia. What are they eating? Animals that have really bad insomnia. I mean, you know, chronic pain. All these things. We force these animals into these horrific nightmares of mental stress, stress management, right? We, they are just totally stressed. And we're eating that. We're, and the pharmaceutical industry is making billions of dollars and controlling the media and controlling the messages we're getting. And when are we going to wake up and connect these dots and see the bigger picture and realize that it's very simple. As we treat others, we will be treated. It's the golden rule. I mean, it's <laughs> fundamental teaching. It's at the core of every tradition. I, you know, I used to teach college courses in comparative religion. It's beautiful to see that the wisdom traditions of all the world actually agree. If we would actually live by these teachings, uh, you know, we, would, we, 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 can, we can celebrate our lives on this beautiful earth. There's nothing stopping us. It, really. <laughs> it's absolutely possible. <clears throat> so, so this is the foundation. This is the basic idea that, that if we... Um, 
that would, you know, like, like when you look at the, the spiritual teachings, if you sort of distilled all the world religions down into one sentence, it would probably be something like this. Whatever you most want for yourself, give that to others. It was basically whatever you most, if you want to be loved, then be loving. If you want to be abundant, then be generous. If you want to be free, then f- let others be free. You know, as soon as we do, as soon as we enslave others, we find we don't have freedom. As soon as we... Um, are, are, are violent or abusive to others we find we live in a less loving world. And this is the way, this is, we know this at a deep, in a deep level. Another way of saying that, of course, is, is, um, is the golden rule. Uh, whatever you most want for yourself, give that to others. And another way of saying it also is um, uh, whatever you sow, you will reap. You know, this basic teaching, whatever you put out will come back. I call it in the, in the World Peace Diet the boomerang effect. And so we have to understand that even though the animals who we are killing 75 million every day, you know, this huge animal agriculture system we have, even though they do not retaliate, they don't retaliate, they don't rise up and do a class action lawsuit against those human beings, you know, I'm gonna, we're gonna sue them and, and charge them for damages. <laughs> I mean, I'd love it if they could, but anyway, <laughs> they, they, but really, they, they cannot retaliate. They don't retaliate, they just take it. They just suffer, they just suffer. Whatever you do to them, that's, what happens? And what we don't see, though, because we don't make the connections, is that even though the animals themselves do not retaliate, our violence toward the animals always retaliates. It comes back to us. It comes back to us as physical disease, as psychological disease, as social disease, environmental disease. It comes back to us as these, as these forms of suffering that we're, that we're feeling ourselves, that we need med- medications for, or that we're living in a, in a society that reduces our capacities. And, and so the whole idea is to realize that our, the way we live our lives matters at a deep level. The way we treat other living beings matters. The way we treat animals who are at our mercy matters. That we hold these animals in our hands. Just, you know, we, they, how do we treat them? You know, and like Jesus said, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. You know, these are very profound teachings. We, we are... Uh, able to show mercy to these animals. We are able to let them celebrate their lives as they are designed to do. And as each one of us understands that and moves our lives more into alignment with our, uh, our values, then we'll be able to actually create the kind of society that reflects our values. And I think, again, the good news is that there's really nothing stopping us from doing that. The foundation of all of this is to understand that we have been lied to, that to understand that there's a huge hoax going on, that we don't need to eat animal foods to get enough protein. We definitely don't need to eat, eat enough uh, eat, eat, uh, dairy products to get enough calcium, and uh, that we're not inherently uh, superior to animals in the sense that we're uh, here to, to just dominate and exploit them and use them however we want, that our, we're here to be in a sense, part of the celebration on this planet and to discover that. So I want to uh, just close by thanking all of you. As I said in the beginning, I know if you found your way here, either physically or um, through the uh, capacities we have to record this, that you're already on the path of questioning the official stories of our society. And there's no greater gift, really, we can give to the world than to do this, to really question everything. You question everything. The, the, the official stories of our society are created in many ways to keep us completely asleep. And so uh, it's important for us, all of us, to leave here and continue to do our research, continue to spread this message, uh, to continue to, to take our attention and turn it within, to connect with the truth that what we are is consciousness, what we are is awareness, that what we are is essentially free and of the nature of love and compassion and kindness, and that we can bring that into our relationships in a way that is meaningful for not only for ourselves but for others. So bless you all and let's uh, go forth and create a world of peace and freedom for all living beings. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Much love to you all. Yeah, we have to just... Um, you have to realize, I think, that, you know, the, the basic thing is to realize that we do have, a, uh, at the core, we do have the truth on our side. 
and, and to, I think it's Shel Silverstein. Shel Silverstein uh, composed a poem, that, which I think is really terrific. It's called Point of View. And it goes like this. Thanksgiving dinners, sad and thankless. Christmas dinners, dark and blue. When you stop and try to see it from a turkey's point of view. <laughs> Sunday dinner isn't sunny. Easter feasts are just bad luck. When you stop and try to see it as a chicken or a duck. Oh, how I once loved tuna salad, steak and lobster, lamb chops too, till I stopped and looked at dinner from the dinner's point of view. <laughs> I think I love that poem, yeah. And uh, I, think the, um, I think the real operative word in that poem is that word stopped, you know, until I stopped and looked at dinner. Because all of us, I think, in many ways, are just propelled by our cultural programming to just go on. You know, we kind of got these blinders on. We're just doing what we've been told. You know, we don't look up. We just do what we're told. We can go on and we eat what we're to- supposed to eat. And, and uh, if we can somehow stop and take the blinders off and then see the bigger picture and realize there's another way of living, then we can begin to be the force for the healing of our planet. And I think not only will other human beings be grateful, but all living beings, the animals, all of us will be grateful. So let's go forth and bring this message. And tomorrow I'll take questions for sure, tomorrow morning. Thank you very much. Much love to you. Thank you. Thank you very much.